this psalm this morning. Of course, it's, it's very well known, isn't it? Uh, it's one of the psalms perhaps that we might learn off by heart. It's, it's very often read, isn't it, as a comfort to the dying. And it is a comfort to the dying. But perhaps we should be familiar with it, as familiar with it as we can be, uh, so that it might be a blessing to the living. Because if it's going to speak words of comfort to us on that last day, which I'm sure it will, then it's today, this day, uh, in life as we journey through life, that we must know and experience the Good Shepherd and travel the path that it speaks of. Um, so that's why we're reflecting upon it this morning. How can we be assured that we're going to make it through life and reach the destination that we hope for? You know, perhaps that's a thought that's troubled you at the moment. Am I, I going to make it? You know, I feel that prone to wander in my heart. Uh, will the Lord keep me? Will I be kept? Will I make that final safe haven? Will I get to heaven? Well, uh, I think we find some answers to that question right here in the psalm. The psalm is introduced to us as a psalm of David. That's just not just been just penned there and added there. That's part of the scripture. That's, uh, uh, that's there from its origin. And it would be interesting, wouldn't it, to, uh, to know at what point in David's life he penned the words to this psalm. Because we know that uh, as a youth he, he was a shepherd boy himself, wasn't he? Perhaps he wrote it in his early years, or perhaps more likely it was written some years later as he looked back and reflected upon his life and just recognized that, that God had been like a shepherd to him. And of course, if you've plotted David's life, you know all the ins and outs and ups and downs and troubles and difficulties that he faced. We're not going to perhaps have an answer to that question as to what time in his life he wrote it until we get to meet him. What a wonderful thought that we might meet King David one day and be able to reflect with him on some of these lovely psalms and his experiences together. What we do know, of course, is that David was the youngest of a number of brothers, wasn't he? And he was left at the point at which we kind of come across him. We, he, he was left with the task uh, most likely left by his older brothers. I'm sure all the brothers in their time, you know, had to do a little bit of shepherding. But, but once they all got older and there's, there's one youngster left, there's no one for him to pass it on to. And he's left doing the shepherding job, isn't he? And... Um, uh, being a shepherd, it's not exactly thrilling, is it? When compared to joining Saul's army and fighting the Philistines, which is when we come across uh, David later on, don't we? Chapter 17 of First Samuel. But you know, at that point in David's life as a youngster, this task gave him a purpose for to, to fulfill, didn't it? It gave him a useful work to do and experiences that we can read that shaped him. And perhaps most of all, the time to quietly ponder as he looked over the sheep, as he took in the wonder of creation around him, as he reflected upon God's providence in so many different ways. And I think we can see in the psalm a sense of this, this personal experience and this journey that David him, himself has been on, which is why he's able to make it so, so personal. The psalm is very personal, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. He leads me. It continues. This isn't just theoretical out there. This is born by some practice and experience that he's been through. This, in many ways, is David's confession. Not a confession of sin like Psalm 51, but a confession of faith, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. 
Well, those are the words as it begins. The Lord is my shepherd. The psalm, in fact, begins and ends with Yahweh, or sometimes we might think of the name Jehovah the Lord. If you have one of the kind of older, more classical uh, versions of the Bible, like the King James, New King James, or, or such, uh, then the name of the Lord, when it is the divine name, Yahweh, is in, in capitals right there, isn't it? In the text. The Lord is my shepherd. And notice how it almost ends the psalm. And, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beginning and end is the Lord, you see. Life is framed from beginning to end by the Lord himself. And as David reflects on his journey through life, there, there is a destination at the end here. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we're to know, aren't we, that from beginning to end, we're in the tender hands of God himself. And as Jesus said, none is able to pluck us from those hands, John 10, 28. Well, who is this Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh? How often do we ponder the wonder and privilege of knowing and having the Lord as our shepherd? This, this is the Lord, the Lord God that the Bible reveals is, is the one who is the creator of the ends of the earth. He is the, the fount of all living things, isn't he? He spoke and worlds came into existence, and life was brought from the dust of the earth, as it were. He's the one who stretched out the heavens and fills them. He's beyond time and space, isn't he? He's the author of life and all living things, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, from eternity to eternity, thou art God. And yet, as David muses in another psalm, he who fills the, the universe is mindful and thoughtful and caring of feeble man. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. God, who considers the nations, and there's what, close to 10 billion of us on, on the face of, uh, face of the earth right now, or there will be soon. And yet the nations are as a drop in the bucket to God. We're as dust in the balance, is what it says in Isaiah 40 and verse 15. He could dispense with mankind in a moment, couldn't he? We're nothing really but a speck. Our lives are like the morning mist. The sun rises and the mist is gone isn't it? And yet God counts us as precious, doesn't he? He draws near. He makes himself known. He, this psalm indicates that he kind of puts his name at risk to come alongside us in our faultless and our fault lines and our failures and so on. He's there with us. Sometimes his name is scorned because of our actions and the things that we do, and yet he remains faithful alongside us. Why? Because as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. The Lord is our shepherd. Who is this Lord who is our shepherd? You know, it's tempting with the Old Testament to think this psalm is about the father. You know, we might read it in the Old Testament. We, we, we might naturally think, well, this is surely about the Father. But I don't think we should think it is about the Father and therefore not the Son. It is about God, the whole God, our Godhead, isn't it? It might seem at times, I've had this conversation on the doorstep with, with those who come and, and knock on the door, and there's people who would draw a distinction between uh, Yahweh 
the divine name for the Lord, and Adonai, which is another word in the Hebrew for Lord, and try and draw a distinction between them and say, ah, this is the Father, this is the Son. And, and so here, Psalm 23, this refers to the Father, it doesn't refer to the Son. An example of this is Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, and there's both the Hebrew words for Lord there, and we can understand that. There's some way of understanding that, that, that here is the Father speaking to the Son. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't follow that actually in every place, the Lord, capitals, Yahweh, the divine name, only refers to the Father and not to the Son. Who is it that Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6? He saw the Lord in all his glory didn't he? The Lord capitals, Yahweh in all his glory. And yet John 12, 41 says the person he saw in all his glory was the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. In the Old Testament, it says, Joel 2, 32, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah, capitals, shall be saved. And yet, Paul shows us Romans 10, 13, that it is about calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus that we shall be saved. And the creation psalm, Psalm 102, which re repeats uh, again and again uh, the reflections upon the Lord God as created is applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. Go and read it for yourself. In fact, what greater revelation of God the shepherd could there be than the presence of God among us in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Who is this shepherd? It is our God, isn't it? It is the good shepherd who came to seek and to save that which was lost who came to give his life for the sheep. The one who came to do that is none other than God himself. But we might think about, about why is there this motif of a shepherd? Why is that the kind of picture that, uh, that Scripture calls upon to express this relationship between God and us? You know, we live in a day, don't we, where you can, you can uh, employ a counsellor for therapy. You can have a personal trainer if you want. You can go to a lawyer or a financial advisor, can't you, Dan? And you could even employ a life coach to get you through the circumstances ahead. Have you seen any adverts out there in the personal columns for a shepherd? Looking for a shepherd. You don't see it. You don't even see shepherds really even offering their services. You might do up in the Lake District, perhaps. But uh, people aren't on the look for a shepherd, aren't they? I, I, I guess if you looked in yellow pages or online for shepherd, there's not going to be many there, are there? There's going to be all kinds of other advisors. And yet the fact that such advisors exist and, and make a good living out of it reveal that we recognize and know we have a need. We've got some lack here, haven't we? That in reality, we realize we can't thrive alone, but needs the guidance and help for dependence and direction upon the wisdom and advice and mentoring of another. And one of the sober lessons in life is to realize that, that we're dependent, mortal creatures, aren't we, that are not self-sufficient you know all those advisors and coaches and counselors I've mentioned they might help you in life but will any of them help you face death they might think that they can but actually they're going to face death very much themselves aren't they to whom can we look to the weightier matters of real life and death to others that are just like ourselves, mortal humans, or to the one who is the source of all strength, of all wisdom, the one who is behind all things to God himself. So, you know, it might not sound very sexy in the 21st century to think of God as our shepherd, but actually, we need him, don't we? And, the, and as we shall see, the kind of 
visual image of the shepherd is something that we realize that we need because we're on a journey through life. It's like we're passing through a wilderness of experiences and we need to know that someone is going to lead us to the destination that we hope for. Life is going to take us through needy times, isn't it? And dangerous places and difficult experiences. And as we shall see, the imagery of a shepherd is one that God has chosen for it speaks well of his nature. God is a tender, caring shepherd to his people. It speaks well of our nature, like sheep gone astray. And that's why we need a shepherd, because God likens us all to sheep, doesn't he? In fact, it's, it's interesting to, you, you, you might want to do this sometime, to, to think through all the animals that God uses to describe some aspect of of mankind's nature at times. He says we shouldn't be like the horse or, or the mule that needs bit and bridle to, to kind of hold us back or to, to uh, whip us without understanding into place, Psalm 32, verse 9. When Jesus hung on the cross, he, it, it says that there were dogs that surrounded him, strong bulls of Bashan. Who's he, were, were there dogs there barking? No, this is people. Vicious, snarling, mocking, scorning, strong bulls, roaring lions, Psalm 22. We're to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves, Jesus says. But you know, the most often the Lord implies, uh, employs an image for people, it, it is of sheep. Because no doubt we are like sheep, we're vulnerable aren't we, to the wolves and dangers around us. Like sheep, Isaiah 53, 6, we go astray. Everyone goes after his own way. No, this is what makes me happy. That's why I'm going. That's what I'm doing. I don't care. We go our own way and do our own thing, don't we? We get lost and are in need of tender care. In our English translation here, shepherd is a noun. The Lord is my shepherd. If, in, in the sentence, that's, how, that's the structure of it. But actually, you know, in the Hebrew, it's part of a verb. It's a participle. And actually, a, a, a way of translating this might be, the Lord is shepherding. That's how we often translate a participle. Is shepherding me. The Lord is shepherding me. When it's a construction like that, it, it means the Lord is the one who... The one who shepherds me. But the fact that it's a kind of verb rather than a noun just gives that little nuance, that little nudge that, that this is an active thing that God does. It's not just some kind of position that he employs. No, this is something that God does. He shepherds. He shepherds me. So how should we understand God's shepherding of you and me? What does it mean? Well, this is what... This psalm is about the good shepherd provides, doesn't he? The good shepherd provides. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Because the Lord shepherds us, the promise is we shall not want. David knew times of lack, but actually he knew really that in those times of lack, the Lord wonderfully provided for him, that he didn't go without, that he didn't face hunger. And this is a word of promise, isn't it? It's a word of promise for us to know. It's, a, it's for us to remember and to hold on to by faith. How can we hold on to this? Well, it's all about the relationship that we have with God, who is the shepherd. He provides for us because we're his sheep, aren't we? We belong to him, and so he cares for us. You know, in, in, in this country, the, the land is, is so green, isn't it, that go up to, 
Derbyshire or the Lake District, Yorkshire and places. The hillsides are so green that they just kind of put up these, uh, these nice uh, stone walls, don't they? Dry stone walls. And, you know, there's a green hillside and you can just put the sheep in there and leave them to graze and look after themselves. That's how we do it here. But in the Middle East, it's not so. The climate is far hotter. The territory is far drier. And it's the shepherd's daily responsibility to feed the sheep and to provide for them what they need to eat and drink. Here, a shepherd might, might uh, gather the sheep from one field where he's left them for, for some weeks or months and, and move them with with dogs or a dog or two perhaps to some other place and he'll be behind them and drive the sheep but not there in the Middle East no there shepherding is a nomadic it's a pastoral uh, 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 activity the shepherd like on the picture on the front of our bulletin and on the whatsapp group this morning the shepherd goes ahead of the sheep doesn't he he leads them from place to place he leads them to follow him to the places where they will find what they need. And so David ponders that just as a shepherd leads the sheep to green pastures, so the Lord provides for us as we look to him and rely upon him and follow his voice and hear his call. I think the Lord Jesus had this in mind, didn't he, when he said in John 10, verses 9 and 10, I am the door. We know in context it was the door to the sheepfold, wasn't it? I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and find what? Find pasture. Green by He will find the food he needs for his soul. The thief, he just comes to, to kill and steal and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. John 10, 9 and 10. When the Lord is our shepherd, we have his promise of provision, don't we? We shall not lack what we need. He doesn't promise to give us everything we might want because our wants left unchecked might be endless. Those of you with youngsters, what would you, what do you want? They might start to list out and keep listing and keep listing. You think that's going to break the bank balance. Well, the Lord doesn't promise, even for us, everything that we might want. Because we're to be content with such things as we have. Our focus isn't to be on earthly things, but on heavenly things. That's where our treasure is to be, isn't it? With the Lord in heaven. But the Lord knows the things that we need. And he promises to provide them. My God shall provide all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. That's another precious promise of God, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. He will give us this day our daily bread and I'm sure so much more besides as well because God knows our needs and promises to feed us and to lead us to rest and refreshment just as described here and note he doesn't just provide for the physical body but for the spiritual side of us too he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. there's rest there's food there's sustenance there's uh, thoughts there he leads me beside the still waters refreshment and so on he restores my soul here speaking of that inward renewing uh, restoration restore means to uh, in the in the original language to return to fullness to return to fullness you know, in this, this earthly life will pass, won't it? Our, our body will perish, won't it? This body as it is, and this world as it is, it cannot be sustained as it is forever. It needs renewal and transformation. And to give us that hope and possibility of being made new, Christ came from heaven, didn't he? 
to seek and to save that which was lost, to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be the bread from heaven, the manna from God. He came to give his life as life for the world, didn't he? And he freely gives that we might drink deeply of the living water which springs up to eternal life, that we might eat to satisfaction, as it were, of the bread of life which will not fuel us just for this life and this body and and the daily energy, but as it were, to feed and restore our soul and spirit, that it might be filled with the new life that God imparts to us in the darkness of our lost state. Yes, he restores our soul. Are you resting in the Lord? Are you feeding upon him? the satisfying provision that he gives. For he is the bread of life, isn't he? Have you drunk from those refreshing waters? Because without that, how is your soul going to be restored, you see? Without that, well, we just remain a physical body which gets older and creakier and wrinklier and starts to fail and go dry. And so will your soul too. It will perish along with you. But our life-giving God has given his life for his sheep, hasn't he? And, And it is to sustain us through to eternal life with him. We need to make sure that we're feeding on that which our good shepherd has provided for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The good shepherd protects, doesn't he? The good shepherd protects. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Twice we have here in in, in this uh, sentence is here, he leads me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. He leads me uh, through the valley. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. You know, in the NIV, it's he guides me. And that's probably better. Not only does God provide, but he protects too. And he protects us by guiding us. In his way, if you're somebody asks you for directions to get from here to there, and you know you know the cut through the cut through way where it's really dangerous, but you think I don't think I better describe that to them. I'm going to give them the straightforward way. You know, go up there, go to the roundabout, turn left, go to the next round, turn right, keep keep going straight, and you'll get there. You know, there's a little back path, but but it's so easy to get lost that way. That's not the way that you guide them. But God guides us, doesn't he? It's, it's, it's like we're like sheep, each one going his own way and going astray. And we need the Lord to guide us back to himself. He leads us beside the still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. What does this mean? Well, he's leading us to walk a righteous path, to live righteously as he calls us to. Living a righteous life may not protect us from physical dangers because doesn't the scripture say they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But it will protect us from many spiritual dangers and there are plenty of them. If we're walking in the paths of righteousness, if we're walking as holy a life and as set apart a life as we can before God, when the temptation comes, we have the strength to overcome it. If, but if we're living in sin, how easy it is for that sin within to become a kind of place where the, the hook of temptation can lock on and we're drawn aside, aren't we, by the enemy. He guides us for his name's sake. He calls us by his name, by name, doesn't he? And when he does so, it's as if he places his name upon us. It's interesting, you go up and see the sheep out in the field sometimes and, 
And you, if you look at them, you might see, well, in this field, they've all got a red marker on them, and some other field, they've all got a blue marker on them. And, and there's different markers that, uh, that the shepherd might have to identify uh, one person's sheep versus another person's sheep in case they go astray and get into some other flock, you see. And so likewise, God has adopted us into his family. He's set his name upon us. And it's like he's committing himself to keep us. He guides us, doesn't he? For his name's sake. What does this mean? Well, ultimately, his glory is going to be revealed in those who he safely brings through the troubles of this life to be with him in eternity. There's no glory for God in a lost sheep. Oh, yeah, Julius, yeah, well, I called him. I kind of lost him somewhere along the way. Oh, well, you know. No, there's glory for God in bringing us through all those difficult places and causing us to triumph at the end through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be brought to him and brought into the safety of the shepherd's fold, finally, into God's presence. That's how he's going to gain, ultimately, his glory and he, his name is kind of associated with us. He's going to have to do it now. He's called us and said his name upon us. How does he do that? Well, he works in us to conform us to his image, doesn't he? To, or the image of his son. He's, he's working all things together for good for those who love him. So that even when his sheep face troubles, they can trust that God is at work through them to bring them uh, uh, to safety or to bring some good out of it or some glory for God, some testimony in our lives. But we see here, don't we, that, that God's path can lead us through, through dangerous and difficult territory sometimes. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, go up on a nice high hill, and, and you have a lovely vantage point, don't, don't you? You can see down over the hills. You can see some others over there. The sky's there, the clouds. You can follow the, the, the meandering river you might see in the distance. You've got that wonderful view there. But once you start to, to, to walk down into the valleys and so on, you might find yourself in a much more kind of constrained place, mind you. And life does lead us through those dark valleys at times, doesn't it? When you're up in the, in, in the open fields, you, you can see there's a marshy spot over there. I won't walk down there. Uh, there's some kind of stones and things. Like, I'll, I'll walk around them. You can see them clearly. But, but once you get down into the valley and, 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 the, and the sides come up around you, you you're looking down the road, uh, down the, the pathway ahead, and it's gone round a corner, and you don't know what's round the corner. Maybe the river's running rough, uh, rough around there. Maybe it's gone over the pathway and so on. There's there may be danger there. And that's a little bit like life, isn't it? There's fears and dangers that lurk ahead. And stoke our fears, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what might be, the fear of pain that we've experienced before, the fear of going through a circumstances again that we've been there and how painful it was and how difficult it was that first time. And we don't want to do it again if we can avoid it. Life can take us through such places, can't it? Places where doubts plague us and Fears trouble us. But God doesn't lead us there that we might trip up and fall over, does he? he? He leads us through the trial. Not that we might fail, but that we might grow in faith and trust him. And of course, the greatest test of our trust is going to be when we face the valley of the shadow of death. Not just darkness, not just for times when we can't quite see our what we've got to do next and so on, but when death itself kind of looms ahead of us. And it will for every one of us, won't it? You know, some of us are quite young and we don't really kind of need to think about it. It's kind of ahead, but every day ticks by and surely but surely we, we, we must be drawing closer to the day of our death. It's going to come to us all, isn't it? Well, what's going to give us hope? When death looms big, 
It's only the hope that we have in God through Christ, isn't it, that can bring light into that kind of darkness, into the darkness faced by death. And how does that mean? Well, because we're, we're following the one who's been through death and punctured right through it and come out the other side. He's blazed the trail. And so we know that we can cling hold of him and he will bring us through. He rose from the dead and like him we're going to rise too. That's why David says, I will fear no evil. How can he be so confident? Because you are with me. You are with me. God is beside me. God is with us. His presence is among us. His spirit in our hearts. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's his wonderful promise, isn't it? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God is with us. None can pluck us out from the Father's hands. And he works all things together for good to those who love him. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I've got to go this way and there's things that are troubling me and I, I really wish I could go some other way. Even the Lord Jesus faced this, didn't he? Yet I will feel no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, let's just move on here. Finally, the good shepherd prospers. The good shepherd prospers. The end of the psalm seems to turn to one of abundance and blessing. You know, when God is our shepherd, he doesn't just furnish a table in the wilderness. There's a psalm that reflects on how God furnished a table in the wilderness for the, for the, for the, for the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. In the middle of nowhere, God prepared for them. Well, here, God will even furnish a table in the presence of our enemies, which I suppose was similar back then because there were certainly enemies around, weren't there? The key verb here is, is prepare. It means to, to order or arrange or furnish or lay out. And this, if we hold on to that thought of, of arranging things, preparing and arranging and so on. It just reminds us of God's sovereignty over our circumstances, that ultimately he's going to prosper and to bless, though we may have to pass through lean times on the way. You know, there are times, aren't there, when the enemy scoffs. Where is your God now? Where is he? All seems to be going wrong for you right now, isn't it? You know, we've, we've given our testimony and we're facing troubles. Where's your God now? They certainly cried that out to the Lord Jesus, didn't they, on the cross? The world scorns us for our stand sometimes, doesn't it? It wants to bully us into following its way of thinking. And we can kowtow to that or, or we just have to trust in the Lord. And trust that he is going to, as it were, prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. He's going to bring me through this. He's going to, he's going to arrange what's needed for my protection, for my provision, for, for me to prosper in this difficult moment, even in the face of enemies. Yesterday, 500 years ago to the day, April the 17th, 1521, Martin Luther was there at the Diet of Worms, which wasn't a bowl full of worms to eat. It was a diet and a, a, an assembly at a place called Worms, where he was tested and tried and quizzed about his belief that God justifies by faith. And that the church selling its indulgences, the Roman Catholic Church, was doing a wicked an awful thing and what was it he he said he had to trust in the lord that god would prepare a table for him in, in the front of his image here i stand i can do none other so help me god other words he is reputed to have said and so for us also sometimes 
The enemies are there and we just have to stand and God and trust in him. For in time that we know, God can turn the tables. And he will turn the tables. Where are those that mocked Jesus when he hung on the cross? Where were they on the Sunday? Well, they, they, they were excluded. They didn't know what was going on, truly, did they? And if they really realized, they would repent in dust and ashes for their mockery of the Son of God. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. Save yourself while he hangs there to save the very scoffers. You see, God turns the tables, doesn't he? Christ, through suffering, was raised up to glory. Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And we have to hold on to those same things ourselves, don't we? In God's hands, suffering leads to glory, doesn't it? In God's hands, humility leads to exaltation. Those who fall at his feet will rise, won't they? That's the promise. The Lord Jesus will be testified in due time. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And those who are his also, funny enough, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and admired among all those who have believed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. The world may mock and scorn and give us difficulties right now, but the day will come when the tables will turn. When, when the, the return of the Lord Jesus in flaming fire is for us a joyful expectation, a day of reunion and rejoicing in the Lord, but for others, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb because they're unprepared for that day. The tables have turned. You know, the troubles we face may well be real, but, but God is arranging everything for our good, isn't it? He anoints our head with oil. Our cup runs over. He, he is pouring out his goodness and mercy to follow us all the days of our life. He's going to bring us through hardship into abundance. For his goodness and mercy, that's the word chesed again, I, can't, I like to point that out just so you see that so many times when it speaks of God's mercy, here translated mercy, sometimes loving kindness. God's goodness and mercy, his chesed, his loving kindness, won't just follow us, it's, it's actually pursue us. You know, it's, not, it's, like, it's like God is pursuing us with his goodness all our days. And finally, in the way he prospers us, the good shepherd will bring us home, won't he? He will pursue us with his goodness all the days of our life. And David's confession is, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When your life is in the good shepherd's hands, you can have confidence and assurance in your final destination the lord is my shepherd and he's going to bring me home and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever this word dwell means to return to it's like we've departed and god is bringing us back back home to the house of the lord to the presence of the Lord, to the place where the Lord is, Lord is forever. So as we finish this morning, is the Lord your shepherd? It might not sound a very 21st century sexy kind of a thing to think about, but actually when we think about it in relation to life, it's a very real and important thought, isn't it? About knowing the Lord so well that we can think of him as our shepherd. And he is our shepherd. He is seeking you out. He's calling you by name. And we're to hear that call and trust him and follow him all the days of our life. And we can know that even through the difficulties and the hardships, the troubles that will come, God will bring us through them 
that he might gain glory in our lives by bringing us safely to that last sheepfold, as it were, to the safe haven where we'll be with him forever. So hear his call and trust in him today. And don't doubt in the darkness what God has taught you in the light. Let's close in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us this day. Thank you, Lord, for the precious image of you, our heavenly Father, as our great shepherd. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world to reveal God to us, to seek us out, to deliver us from the hands of the enemy and from all that might afflict us, and to bring us safely back to you, that we might come home and be sure of that. So, Father, we thank you for your mercies to us and give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.